Have you ever been on an IT or business change project that didn't live up to expectations? If so, you're certainly not alone. There have been many studies conducted on IT project success rates. The results of these research studies vary, but they all agree on one thing, that there are more IT failures than successes. On average, only about one in three projects are successful. Some others are complete basket cases and end up getting cancelled. The rest either fail to meet business objectives or have very large cost or schedule overruns. Many of the failed projects have a negative ROI or return on investment. This means that the benefits of the projects are less than the costs. So how expensive are these project failures? In a word, very. One way to quantify these costs is to use the gross domestic product or GDP of a country. According to the World Technology and Services Alliance, countries spend about 6.4% of their GDP on IT. Now Roger Sessions from Object Watch has combined this with research on project failure rates. He estimates that the cost of IT failures in each country is about 0.089% of their GDP. If this is right, then each year Australia wastes $82 billion on failed IT projects. For the UK, the figure is $200 billion, and for the USA, well over $1,000 billion. So the big question then is, why do so many IT projects fail? Not surprisingly, many researchers have looked at this question. If you do a quick search on the internet, you'll find lots of lists about success factors and common problems. In fact, the causes of project failure are well known, and many of these are self-inflicted wounds. In other words, the causes aren't from external influences, but rather from the project teams themselves. In 2010, Janika surveyed 600 people in the IT industry. A staggering 75% of these people believe that their projects are either always or usually doomed right from the start. So are we all simply resigned to the fact that most of our projects will fail? If we know the causes of the problems and we all have the right intentions, why is it that we keep making the same mistakes? I think one of the problems with lists like these is that they don't show the independencies between factors. In this video, we'll look at one factor that features prominently in many of the lists and is a major cause of project failure, poor project communication. We all know that clear communication is important. We know that we should communicate more effectively and more often. And at the start of a project, we might even promise ourselves that this time we'll do it better. But then, in all the chaos of a project, clarity of communication is often the first casualty. So why is this? Knowing that we need to communicate better is not enough. As we'll see, there are often fundamental structural problems that prevent us from communicating the way we'd like. So let's look at a basic project structure. Projects are all about creating something new, so first we need to build it. For example, this could be a new computer system and its associated business processes. This typically involves business analysis, system design and development, programming and testing. Now there are many teams that complete these tasks, but collectively I've called them the technical team. Once this new thing is built, we need to get people to use it. This is the human side of change and includes change management, user documentation and training. And I've called this the transition team. Now this is perhaps a good time to raise the question, can projects get by without a change management function? Well, a McKinsey study examined 40 companies and looked at the expected project value for each one. It found that the top 11 companies had results 43% higher than expectations, while the bottom 11 had results that were 65% lower than expectations. What was the difference? Well, the top performing companies implemented effective organizational change management strategies, while the bottom 11 didn't. We know from studies like these that change management is important, and yet the technical team often consume most, if not all, of the budget. It's also not uncommon for some of the transition budget to be reallocated to the build team to help cover cost overruns. So what's the solution? Is there a way for us to be more efficient so for the same or even less budget we can provide both teams with the resources they need? Fortunately, the answer is yes.
Of course, the build phase is not actually the first thing to do. First, we need to define the project. This not only includes planning, but also setting up the structures and procedures that will be needed throughout. This involves identifying a clear vision and objectives of the project that are consistent with overall business strategy. At this stage, it's also important to define project procedures and templates that will be used throughout the project. The objectives then need to be broken down into clear and detailed business requirements. And finally, there needs to be clear roles defined. This has to include a clear delineation of responsibilities between the vendor and the client, right through to individual roles and accountabilities. We can think of the defined phase as being similar to the plans and foundations for a house. The owners might be keen to see the walls go up and have the house built by a certain date. Maybe there are financial incentives to progress quickly. This is all fine, but if this pressure results in shortcuts in the foundation, eventually the final quality will suffer. And the resulting problems are generally very expensive to fix. On projects, there's often lots, a lot of pressure from sponsors and managers to see progress in the build phase. Also, most people find it more fun to build something than simply plan it. So on projects, the define phase often gets squeezed. Although there might be some small savings here, this invariably leads to more rework in the build phase with corresponding schedule and cost blowouts. On one project, the testing phase blew out to over four years, mainly due to poor business requirement management. The project then limped along with massive rework and multiple trial and error testing cycles. These problems then often put pressure on the transition team, which even makes things worse. Although the build phase is important, we've also seen that it's critical to have a strong foundation on which to build the project and an effective transition team to help everyone move in once it's built. But there's one final component to this project map. To find a clue as to what this is, let's go back about 35,000 years to the oldest discovered cave paintings. Here for the first time, early humans were able to pass information from one generation to the next. But times have changed a bit. Today we can access millions of terabytes of information on the internet from a tiny smartphone almost anywhere in the world. Even on a medium sized project, the amount of information produced is huge and keeping track of it all can be a real challenge. Projects are organized into teams and in the absence of structured project procedures and templates, they often create their documents in silos. When you have duplicated content in different places, it becomes very difficult to manage. I've seen elaborate tracking spreadsheets and databases to try and make sure the different versions stay up to date. Invariably though, out of date and contradictory information appears in different silos. This obviously creates big problems for the technical team in building the solution, but it also creates problems for the transition team. To find out why, we need to explore the myth that people fear change. People don't fear change itself, otherwise why would we go on an overseas holiday, move house, get married or have kids? These are all life-changing events, yet we enter into them voluntarily. But if people don't fear change, what do they fear and why do they resist change so much? Many years ago when I was studying at RMIT University here in Melbourne, I developed a dull ache behind my left eye. I started to worry about what that might be. Was it a brain tumour? And if so, was I going to go blind or even die from it? I dreaded going to the eye doctor to get diagnosed, and for days I thought about what it would be like to be blind and how I'd cope, all the time with a sick feeling of dread in my stomach. I finally plucked up the courage to go to an eye doctor. He surprised me by barely looking at my eyes. Instead, he asked me lots of questions about university, my relationships and home life. And in the end, he said he was confident the pain would go away. Sure enough, it did. It turned out that the pain was caused by stress and anxiety, which was further increased by me worrying about my impending doom. Even though my brain tumour thankfully wasn't real, my fear certainly was. People worry about losing something of value. In my case, it was my good health. And this fear is amplified tremendously if the future is unknown or unclear. The best transition teams in the world aren't able to communicate change effectively if the project knowledge is ambiguous or inconsistent. Without clear information, people will fear the worst, just like I did with my eye. The solution to this is to create a centralised body of knowledge that can be worked on collaboratively.
By using single source principles together with efficient templates and standards, we can ensure that a single version of the latest information is available to everyone. With the body of knowledge in place, this completes our map of an effective project. I believe all of these structural elements need to be in place to enable clear communication, both within the project team and with the wider business. In addition, there needs to be strong support from the executive throughout the entire project. The body of knowledge is supported by clear project standards, procedures and templates. As the project continues and the knowledge base grows, this becomes a common resource for both the technical and transition teams. The body of knowledge can be designed so that user documentation can be easily extracted from the same documentation sets. This can save considerable time and effort later in the project during the chaos just before go live. Change management can implement their communication and engagement plans in the knowledge that they have consistent and accurate information with which to work. And finally, the training effort can be reduced dramatically by having a consistent body of knowledge and standard user documentation to work with. Signing off on the defined stage by the sponsors is a critical step. We know there'll be pressure to move to the build stage, but as we've seen, unless the project is fully scoped and defined, there is a great risk that the build stage will blow out. In my experience, projects rarely fail due to problems in the technical team. These are people that usually know their technology very well. Similarly, most transition teams are able to provide quality change, documentation and training support, but neither of these groups are able to perform if the foundation building blocks of planning and documentation are poor. Over the next year, many projects will fail, wasting billions of dollars of shareholder value. The only question is, will yours be one of them? By paying more attention to these foundation areas, I believe we can greatly improve the chances of success. My name's Gary Corwell. If you have any comments about any of these ideas, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me at this email address. Until then, here's to your next project success.